All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our second screencast for Chapter 9. And in this screencast, we are going to continue our discussion of the process of cell respiration. Now, if you think back to Section 9.1, and this would be our very first screencast for um, Chapter 9, we had talked about three separate processes that are going to be used in cell respiration to produce ATP. And that first process we had looked at was a process called glycolysis. And in glycolysis, we were able to produce two ATP molecules. Now, the second process was the Krebs cycle. And in Krebs, we were also able to produce two ATP molecules. And the third process was the ETC or electron transport chain. Now this was the process that actually produced the bulk of the ATPs and in this process we were able to produce 32 ATPs. So in this screencast we are going to look at the details that occur in each of these three processes. So the first process we're going to look at is the process called glycolysis. Now remember glycolysis is going to occur in the cytoplasm of the cell and glycolysis is considered an aerobic process. And remember, aerobic basically means no oxygen. All right, so this process does not have to occur in the presence of oxygen. Now, what we're going to do with this process is we are going to take one molecule of glucose and we're going to split that molecule of glucose into two three-carbon molecules. And we're going to call those three-carbon molecules pyruvic acid also sometimes known as pyruvate. And so these two three carbon molecules right here are going to be called pyruvic acid. Now as this process continues we're going to end up producing four ATP molecules at the very end. Now if you think back what we had said at the beginning of the screencast we said glycolysis really only produces two ATP molecules. Well the reason for that is this because if you look up here at the very beginning in order to actually split this glucose molecule into two we needed two molecules of ATP. And so if you think about this at the very end if we produce four molecules of ATP that's really only a net gain of two. Because we had two at the beginning we produced four at the end but we have to account for those two ATP molecules. So we really only have a net gain of two ATPs. Now in addition to producing the two ATPs at the very end, we're also going to be producing an electron carrier. So remember, we have some high energy electrons that need to be carried somewhere. And so we're going to use a molecule called NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And so this NAD is going to be converted over into NADH. So these are going to be considered again electron carriers. And I use the E with the um, minus sign that you see right here to represent electrons. Now these electrons represent energy, so that energy is going to be carried later on to the electron transport chain. And we're going to talk about the electron transport chain a little bit later in the screencast. Now the second process that we need to look at is a process called the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle is only going to occur if there is oxygen present. So this is considered an aerobic type of process. So in this case, if O2 is present, the Krebs can occur. Now, the Krebs is going to use the two pyruvic acids that were created during glycolysis to actually run this cycle. So if you look down towards the bottom at the diagram, remember glycolysis occurred in the cytoplasm of the cell and it produced two pyruvates also called pyruvic acids and these are going to be used in Krebs. Now this process is going to occur in the matrix of the mitochondrion and that's the innermost part of that organelle. So if you look over here to the right this would represent the mitochondrion and if you remember from our discussion in chapter 7 this would represent the insides of that mitochondrion. And so looking at this area right here, this is where Krebs is going to occur, so this inner region of the mitochondrion. Now, during the Krebs cycle, we're going to produce four things. We're going to produce CO2, we're going to produce an electron carrier called NADH, just like we did back in glycolysis. We're going to produce a new electron carrier called FADH2, 
and of course we're going to produce some ATP. Remember we had said back at the beginning of the screencast that the Krebs cycle is going to produce two ATPs at the end. Now if you notice down here in the diagram the pyruvate that we have on the left hand side which again came from glycolysis again which occurred in the cytoplasm is going to be used to produce CO2. So we have one CO2 here we have two more that are produced at the very end so we actually have a production of three CO2s. Now we had said it's also going to produce the electron carrier. Again, the E and the minus sign represents the electron carrier. These represent the electrons and we're going to produce four NADHs. And so we have one that was produced early on, we have two, we have three, and we have four. And these um, electron carriers are going to carry these high energy electrons to the electron transport chain just like they had done in glycolysis. Now we have a brand new electron carrier called FADH2 and you can see that located right here. And it's going to do the same thing that NADH does. It's going to carry those electrons, those high energy electrons, to the electron transport chain. And as we had said before, obviously we're going to produce some ATP in Krebs. Now if you notice, it says down here that the Krebs cycle is going to occur twice. Because remember, we had produced two pyruvic acids or pyruvates in glycolysis. So it's going to go through this entire cycle once, and then it's going to come back and use the second pyruvate and go through this entire cycle a second time. So really, instead of three CO2s, we're going to get six CO2s being produced. Instead of four NADHs, we actually have eight. Instead of one FADH2, we actually have two. And remember, at the end of the Krebs cycle, we actually get two ATPs being produced. And now we know why because this cycle actually goes twice. And again, it's because we had two pyruvic acids produced during the process of glycolysis. So the final process that we're going to look at in cell respiration is going to be the electron transport chain. And so what you need to keep in mind is the electron carriers NADH and FADH2 that we had looked at in glycolysis and of course in the Krebs cycle. And so their main goal is to carry those high energy electrons, which remember represent energy, to help change ADP into ATP. So we're using that energy to add that phosphate onto this molecule so we can create that stored energy that's going to be found in ATP. So that way the cell can use that ATP to power various life processes. And this is going to occur on the electron transport chain. Now these reactions are going to occur in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And sometimes we refer to that membrane as the cristae. And so again, over here on the right hand side, I'm going to attempt to draw another mitochondrion. Remember that we have this kind of wavy pattern on the inside of the mitochondrion. And remember Krebs had occurred on the inside, and so that's going to be represented by red. And the electron transport chain is actually going to occur right on this membrane. I'm trying my best to outline that in blue. And so that blue that you see right here is going to be representing the cristae of the mitochondrion. And so that's where the um, electron transport chain is going to happen. Now it says the high energy electrons are going to be passed from one carrier to the next, eventually using them to combine hydrogen and oxygen to make water. So one of the waste products in this process is going to be water. So water is considered a waste product. All right. Now there's going to be a special enzyme called ATP synthase which is going to be used to help produce that ATP. So for every pair of high energy electrons that actually moves its way down the electron transport chain, on average we will get about three ATPs that are going to be created from this process. So the diagram that you see here is actually an example of the entire electron transport chain. Now before we start talking about what you see down towards the bottom, I want to bring your attention to what you see towards the top. Remember the electron carrier NADH 
from glycolysis, as I had said earlier, was going to be taken to the electron transport chain. So all of those high energy electrons that are being carried by this molecule are going to be taken down to this chain. Now remember, we also had NADH being produced in the Krebs cycle, and we had a brand new electron carrier called FADH2, which is also going to carry high energy electrons also to this chain. Now that energy is going to be used to help push these hydrogen ions that you see right here across these purple structures which are called transport proteins and we had talked about transport proteins back in chapter 7 when we talked about cell transport so we're pushing these hydrogen ions across this membrane now this is considered a form of active transport and if you remember active transport requires energy because we're going from an area of low concentration and you can see there's not very many blue spheres on this side to an area of high concentration. There's quite a few in this intermembrane space. Now remember, all of this is taking place on the cristae or these folds of the mitochondrion. Remember, the matrix was the inside, the cristae was the folds that you see on the outside. Now, as these electrons, as these high energy electrons are being used and passed down these various proteins, you're gonna notice that we're gonna take these hydrogen ions, we're gonna combine them with the O2, which can't happen unless you provide a little bit of energy, and we're going to create H2O. Now remember, H2O represents a waste product, in this case, from this process. Now as we had said before, to create the ATP, we needed a special enzyme, and that's what you see right here. This is going to be the ATP synthase. And this ATP synthase is going to work to push these hydrogen ions you see on this side back over to this side. Now when that occurs, that's going to add a phosphate onto this ADP and produce the ATP that you see here. Now remember we had said as this process happens, we are going to get a total of 32 ATPs being produced from this entire process. So it actually produces the bulk of the ATPs in cell respiration. So looking on the right hand side, what you're going to notice is that together glycolysis, Krebs, and the electron transport chain is going to produce about 36 ATPs per molecule of glucose. We have two for glycolysis, we have two for Krebs, and of course we have 32 for the electron transport chain. Remember, the ETC produces the bulk of the ATP. So you take 32 plus 2 plus 2, and that's going to give us 36 ATPs total. Now, cell respiration is really good at capturing around 36% of the total energy found in one molecule of glucose. And if you notice this 36%, this 36 is very similar to the 36 ATPs that we had taken from that molecule of glucose. So what we have left over is we have 64% left of total energy from that glucose molecule. Well that 64% is not in the form of chemical energy, so it's not in the form that the cell can actually use. It's actually being released as heat energy, so it's a different form of energy. It still does something for us, it helps to keep us warm, but it can't be used to power various cell processes. All right, so that's going to finish up our second screencast for Chapter 9. So again, please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.